Hello again, and welcome back. Thank you for tuning in this week. Before I get into the real estate turf wars, I want to get into some housing and population dynamics. So let's start off with this chart here. This is the population increase versus the housing completions in Canada back to 1955. And you see there in the red line, we have the housing completions and uh, the population increase is the blue line. And you can see a couple of big spikes there um, throughout the years. And of course, the biggest spike right now is uh, 2023. 2024 is projected to be a little bit lower, but uh, yeah, that big top of the spike there, 2023. Now I wanna move on and add to this chart uh, here. And you can see, I hate to get political because I know it doesn't do any good with uh, people because we're all divided when it comes to politics, but I'm just calling out what it is. Uh, the last biggest spike in history was Pierre Trudeau and followed by his son now, which has really outdone him this time. Look at the look at the size of his. He's at, what, 1.2, 1.3 million uh, growing the population, new people in Canada, whether it's uh, babies born, which there's not a lot of that these days. So mostly immigration, foreign workers, foreign students and whatnot. And of course, his father was the last biggest spike back there in 1971, 1972 or so. Now, let's just add a little bit more to this chart. And you can see after that 1970, that early 70s peak in population, uh, we had a recession, 74 to 75. So what's going to happen now? Recession potentially. And we all know, and it's been very clear, a lot of the, or the main reason for the population growth and immigration numbers was to prop up the economy, to stimulate the economy. And this is what happened back in the early 70s. They needed to stimulate the economy, bring a bunch of people in with a bunch of money. They buy houses, cars, or they rent houses in this case because they can't afford them nowadays. One other thing I wanted to point out was back in uh, the 70s there, we actually had a lot higher housing completions and we were actually, our housing completions were increasing going into that uh, population increase and decrease, whereas now they've been flat. So it's going to be a lot different this time, but we're going to talk about that right now. So this next chart, this is a pretty interesting chart and I want to explain it properly to you. So this is the Canadian housing completions, the surplus or shortage by year. So based on a population increase of 2.5 people per household, was there enough homes built or was there too many homes built? So you can see the last 10 years here, back in 2014, we actually had 59,172 extra homes built for the increase in population that year. And you can see in the last 10 years, it doesn't look good we're almost down 300,000 homes. We're short 300,000 units, 284,489. So very concerning there. But when you expand this back out over the long term, uh, back to 1955 as the data goes for one of these, I forget which one, but again, this is as far as I could go back. You can see usually we have a surplus. Of course, we've had the biggest deficit or shortage in housing in the last few years now because of population growth. But uh, over 2 million surplus units since 1955. So that's a big surplus. So again, everyone talks about population and there's a housing shortage. Over the long term, there isn't. But over the short term, of course, there's a housing shortage when you go back 10 years or so. When you go back 20 years, that changes again. We don't actually have a housing shortage. But uh, of course, uh, speculators bought all the homes. So it appears that we have a housing shortage. But now look at the inventory. Inventory is coming back on the market very strong because you have all this pent up supply. We've heard about pent up demand, which I hate that term. But now we have pent up supply that's coming to the market. So again, over 2 million units of surplus since 1955. And this doesn't include any basement apartments or anything like that because they're not considered starts. And let's finish off on this subject with a little politics here. So this is the uh, current government here. You can see we have a shortage of 418,473 units based on their population growth and the housing completions completed in that time frame. The government before that from 06 to 2015, they actually had a surplus of over half a million units because they kept population growth at a steady number around 350,000 per year. And look at the results. We have a surplus of housing. No more houses were built in those years. It's just they didn't go crazy with population. So at 2.5 people per household, uh, an extra surplus there. Now, of course, you can see the current government 
Don't want to mention any names. They have wiped out uh, most of that surplus. Um, so this cannot continue going forward, but I don't think it will. Let's just take another quick look back at that population increase uh, versus housing completions here. Those big spikes, you see them go up every time they go up and they come right back down. It's never a sustained population growth. Uh, it's a it's a temporary stimulus. Uh, they've used money. And now they use people to stimulate the economy. Even here, you can see it shooting right back down. Now let's get on to the turf wars as per this video's thumbnail. Now, there's a lot of shifting going on in real estate, uh, market slowing. That probably has a thing to do with it. But of course, information and technology is making it easier for realtors to operate and making it easier for buyers and sellers to operate too. But uh, I want to go through, this is Ontario here. Now, if you've heard me talk about it so many times on this channel. This is where it so was last year in 2023. You can see there's about 18 boards uh, included in this map. All the blue ones are parts of ITSO. And of course, note Hamilton there in brown. They were included in the ITSO. They were a, a, a two-way integrated data share, but they actually weren't part of ITSO. They're, they don't like to be part of anything, it seems. Uh, Hamilton, Burlington, they like to do their own thing. Now I want to go forward to this year. There's only 12 boards left and there's been some shifting around and you can look at the map there and uh, yeah, it's really shifted. So let me put them side by side here. So there's 2023 and mid 2024 and I've checked marked um, all the places that have switched over to the prop TX or the Toronto system. Now, let me be clear, these boards are not joining Toronto, they're just joining their system, but it's a big data sharing agreement. And eventually, who knows, maybe they will amalgamate, but uh, that's not right now. Now, looking at the left-hand side there, you can see that green, not the aqua, but the actual green, that was part of the Prop TX, which is the Toronto Real Estate Board, which is the biggest board in Canada. But now look, uh, it turned to pink, they're using pink on the new map. That area is expanding. And again, it's to do with fees and computer systems and data sharing and whatnot. Of course, uh, all those check marks are the ones that have already transferred over. And I do have a brown check mark there because Hamilton and Burlington, which is now Cornerstone, they joined the uh, ITSO board because they don't want anything to do with uh, TRAB or Prop TX, from what I know. Now I'm going to add in all the rest of the boards that are also going to be joining. They've already made the announcements by year end. I believe all of them will have joined. And of course, my board's down there now, uh, Niagara board. And then you get over to Ottawa and Cornwall and Kingston, all those areas. They're all joining um, Prop TX. So there's a lot of things shifting around right now in Ontario, obviously Canada's biggest province, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens going forward. But again, uh, this is still all due to the you know the evolution of technology, right? Uh, there's a big lag when it comes to real estate boards because they're very old uh, industries, or it's an old industry, and of course it takes them a long time to change. And uh, finally, it's changing, but we still do have our own individual identities, but we're joining these massive systems which has has been a big issue for data in the past, especially for realtors. Now, at the same time that we have all the shifting around of the real estate turf and boards and computer systems, we actually have realtors leaving the business now for the first time since 2016. And this is very accurate because I even had one of my agents give resignation and leave the business altogether just in the last week or so. So this article from Stories here, TREB membership declines year over year for first time since at least 2016. TREB memberships declined by 1,363 year over year this July to 73,315, marking the first month since 2016 at least to see a yearly decrease. Scott Ingram, a TREB member and chartered accountant, called attention to this unusual drop in membership via a tweet shared last week. So in the big run-up in prices, we had many, many new agents join the industry. There's always many agents joining an industry and many leaving. A lot of agents actually don't produce, so they never actually get their career off the ground. So they leave. Many agents are retired and they get old and they just want to quit the business, obviously, and relax. And there's many agents that are part-time realtors that just don't want to pay the fees anymore. It's not worth it for them. They're wasting their time and uh, they leave the business. So there's a lot of... Uh, 
shifting going on, but there is still many new agents coming into the business too. So you have those uh, supply and demand kind of when it comes to agents. But yeah, looking at this chart here, you see, yeah, it's 73,300 as opposed to 75,500 in 2023. So that's a big drop, and we're going to see this most likely keep continuing to decline as agents are making less and less, they're doing more leasing, and of course, they're getting out of the business. Back to the story. For some, being a realtor isn't as lucrative as it was two or three years ago, especially for those who only work part-time or on occasion. And when you add various membership fees into the mix, it becomes even less appealing. But for casual realtors who may not sell a single home over the course of a year, that's wasted money. Of course it is. You're paying all this money and it's not just a few hundred dollars. It's a few hundred dollars on top of a few hundred dollars and thousands of dollars for your for your board membership. So it is just wasted money. And uh, there's other expenses too. You have to make sure you have a decent vehicle to service your clients, even if it's one client a year. So again, that part-time business is really fading away for a lot of the people and, and they're getting out of it. Steve Tabrizi, a Toronto broker and COO of REMAX Hallmark Group of Companies, shares Ingram's sentiment. He explains that over 80% of realtors conduct fewer than five transactions a year, and increasingly volatile market conditions are making it even harder for them to close those deals. And it is true that over 80% only do five deals or less per year, but it's more like 50% do like two deals or less per year. So when you break those numbers down even more, it gets even more catastrophic when you're talking about paying bills and trying to sell a house. On top of that, the industry is undergoing a technological, regulatory, and sociological evolution, one that is potentially squeezing many agents out of the profession. I saw an agent leave years ago because we started using electronic lock boxes in our board. And he was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. And I, I don't blame him. He'd been doing it for like 30 or 40 years. Modern consumers are increasingly informed and self-reliant, often conducting their own research, he says. Many agents struggle to clearly articulate their value proposition or justify their services, largely due to a lack of comprehensive knowledge, not only within their regulatory framework, but also in understanding the economic landscape, contract law, and customer needs. And I'll agree fully with that. Many agents know nothing about the economic landscape. They just say, oh, now's a great time to buy. And uh, the, the client's buy, and then they come back a year or two later when the house prices have declined and they try to sell it. And they say, oh, I, I didn't know. Jeez, I never saw that coming. Well, you need to know what's happening in the economy, the greater economy, when you're giving advice on making uh, huge asset purchases. For the first time in over a decade, Ontario has seen a reduction of approximately 4.5% in the number of active realtors, and I believe this trend will persist. And of course, why wouldn't they when they're making less and less money, they're doing more leasing, they're just, the income's just not there like it used to be. Here's a chart, uh, I showed this actually a long time back, but uh, this is the average realtor income, and this is based off the number of MLS sales that I have publicly available data on, and of course, the average price points, and I did a commission calculation in there. And you can see like uh, their income or their income has been declining since 2021. 2024 is not going to be any better. And they're actually making the same income as they would have been in 2014 or 2015. And everything's a lot more expensive these days with inflation. So real estate's not so lucrative or not very lucrative for a lot of agents right now. You need to be a good producer, a long-term producer in order for it to be worth your while. So I don't blame these agents leaving the business. Let me know actually in the comments, have you seen or heard of any agents in your lifetime or recently that have left the business? I know I do because I'm in the business, but I'd be interested to hear what you guys say. Anyway, for this week, that's it. And I'll see you next time.